Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I'd like to preach today from the Word of God on the topic of the filling of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit. Heavenly Father, even now as we approach your Word, we ask you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and that is to give us understanding, to enlighten us, to open our eyes that we would grasp the truth so that we might live the truth. And by doing that, bring you the glory that you deserve. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I had the uh, privilege of growing up in a Christian home. Both my parents were saved. We went to church faithfully. Uh, They gave me and my brothers the privilege of going to Christian school from kindergarten all the way until we graduated. And in fact, just last night we were were talking and one of the things that my parents were very careful about is the influences that we had in our lives, making sure that we had godly influences in our lives and we did not have ungodly influences in our lives, whether that was other people or whether it was through media, magazines and different things like that. And uh, they were just very intentional about that. And I'm very thankful for that. And as a result of having grown up in that kind of environment, there are some things that I was never really exposed to until much later. And one of those things was alcohol and drunkenness. I grew up in a home that there was no alcohol, all right? Um, I I don't even think you ever had cooking sherry, am I correct? (laughs) I mean, it just, we just didn't have it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a thing in our house. And, uh, and, and uh, I, of course, knew about drinking and I knew about drunk people, but I- I'm just going to be very blunt with you. The, until I was a teenager, my, my only real frame of reference for drunkenness was Otis on Andy Griffith, okay? That's the kind of home that I grew up in and I am so thankful for that. But as I got older and I began to uh, work out in the world and eventually, of course, got married and and, uh, started uh, my own family, I began to be exposed more and more to to different things in the world. And and I remember uh, when I was um, in Bible college, there was a time where I worked at a hotel uh, while going to, uh, to Bible college. And uh, there at the hotel, I began to be exposed to a lot of things uh, that I had been sheltered from, and rightly so, for many, many years. And one of the things that I began to be exposed to on a uh, far more frequent occasion than I wish was drunkenness. Uh, we had at that hotel room a large ballroom that would frequently be rented out for different events like uh, uh, weddings and uh, parties and of different sorts. And, uh, and so I, I began to uh, be exposed to that on, on a number of occasions. And particularly when I started working night shift on Fridays and Saturdays, I would work from a 11 o'clock Friday night to sa- 7 o'clock Saturday morning and then do the same thing Saturday night to Sunday morning. Uh, those, uh, those weekend nights there began to, began to see a whole lot of things that uh, um, were not good. Uh, involving uh, drunkenness and everything that goes along with that. And, and uh, I have uh, quite a few stories that I could tell from those days. And, and uh, I began to see firsthand um, just exactly why God speaks so strongly against consuming anything that is to- intoxicating uh, because it never results in anything good, godly, or beneficial uh, when it's done that way. And, uh, and when, when we read these verses in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, uh, we, we begin 
with these words, and be not drunk with wine, wherein as excess. Now, depending on your frame of reference, you might have a different picture that comes to mind when you think of someone being drunk with wine. Maybe you were like me when I was very young and very naive, and the only picture you have is someone like Otis from Andy Griffith. Or maybe you've been exposed to a lot more things, and you have a much clearer picture then of what being drunk actually looks like and actually leads to. But I tell you, none of that really compares to the picture that the Ephesians would have gotten in their mind when the Apostle Paul wrote those words to them. The ancient city of Ephesus was known for a yearly festival they would have worshiping the god, the false god, called Bacchus or Bacchus, depending on how sophisticated you want to be. But this god was the god of wine. And so they would have this festival about one to two weeks long in which they would worship the god Bacchus, and they would have different ceremonies and parades and different things. But the primary thing that they would do when they would worship Bacchus, the god of wine, is they would literally fill themselves with their God, that is, they would consume exorbitant amounts of wine and other kinds of intoxicating beverages. And it became very well known all over the world that the city of Ephesus was going to be having this festival every single year. And you can imagine then the kind of wickedness and immorality and outright debauchery that would go on during those times. Can you imagine an entire city given over to that kind of thing? Well, you may not have to imagine about it because we have festivals not unlike that here in our country today. Have you ever heard of Mardi Gras? All right. It's pretty much the same kind of thing. And let me tell you, it is not something that a Christian should have anything to do with at all. So it might be kind of curious to you, it certainly is to me, that the Holy Spirit would use that as an illustration of what it means for Him to be in control of our life. Alcohol has an intoxicating effect, and that means it lowers your inhibitions, it slowers, it slowers, that's not even a word, it slows your reaction times. Now, I don't, I'm not going to go into all the science of it because I don't know it all, but I'm sure if you want a more nerdy explanation, Dr. Allman could probably give it to you later. But we all have a general idea of what it means to be drunk. It means that, that your, your thinking is inhibited, your reactions are slower, and the result is that you are more likely to do things that will hurt yourself or others. Your ability to reason has been impaired, and so you will blindly follow the impulsive desires of your flesh. Let me illustrate it with one story I've shared before from when I worked there at the hotel. I remember this one particular weekend, we had a wedding party in, uh, and like all, almost all the wedding parties that came in to have their banquets at our facility, there was alcohol involved. In fact, many of them would hire someone to come in and tend bar for them. And so there was a lot of drinking involved, but we had a strict policy that at 11 o'clock, the ballroom was closed and everything had to be shut down. And so we had enforced it that night. Everything had been shut down. They were cleaning up in there. And it was probably 11, 30, 12 o'clock, something like that, and and the phone rang at the front desk. I was working front desk that night. So I could see that it was a, a call from one of the rooms in the hotel. Uh, so I picked it up and I said, front desk, how may I help you? And the man on the other end of the line said to me, he said, yeah, I just saw someone fly past my window. Now my immediate thought is, is this guy drunk or is somebody else? <laughs> I said, excuse me? <laughs> you saw what? He said, yeah, I, I just saw somebody fly past my window. So he was on the third floor of a four-story, four-floor hotel. He said that somebody jumped out of the window from the room above me. I saw them fly past my window, and they landed on the first floor ledge on that side of the hotel. The ballroom kind of jutted out, so there was, this, there was a, a one-story roof there. So this person had fallen probably about 25 feet, had jumped about 25 feet. If you could imagine, that would be a roughly the equivalent of a jumping from one of these girders to the ground. I mean, that's 
that's pretty far. And he said, I can see her down there. She's moving around, but I think she's probably going to need help. And I said, I think you're probably right. So we called the uh, um, um, police and the ambulance, and, and we had fire trucks and ambulance and police were there. And, uh, and so they went, and the first thing, obviously, get her off of the roof, make sure she's okay. But then they got to figure out what in the world's going on here, because it, was this a suicide attempt? Did somebody push her? What, what was the deal here? And so the authorities were all handling that while I was doing my thing at the front desk. And a little while later, they took this, uh, the, uh, this uh, young woman out uh, by ambulance and took her on uh, to the uh, emergency room just for evaluation. Miraculously, she was not injured significantly at all. But the thing that was very interesting as I was talking to the first responders after they came down, they sa I said, uh, what, what, what happened? What went on there? Uh, and they said, well, first thing, when we went into the room, we noticed that there were liquor bottles everywhere. And it was obvious that the people that were still in the room she jumped out of the window of uh, were, were very, very drunk. But then we asked her, why did you jump out of the window? And here was her very intelligent very reasoned, very well thought out explanation. You ready for it? They dared me to. They dared me to. Now, I'm going to hazard a guess this morning that if I went to anybody in this room, anybody, okay, there may be a few exceptions, but most people in this room, and I said, I dare you to climb up and out on one of these girders and then just fall to the floor. All right, most of you in here are going to reason that's not a good idea. I'm probably going to get hurt. And the likelihood of me being hurt outweighs whatever thrill I might get of doing that. So no, I'm not going to do it. However, a person who is inebriated, a person who is intoxicated, a person who is drunk doesn't have that ability to reason. It's been impaired, and so if their friend says, hey, I dare you to do this, the impulse of their flesh says, okay, I'll do it, and there's no reason there to stop them. The more drunk you become, the worse it gets. The more likely you are that you'll hurt yourself or you'll hurt others. That's why drunk driving is such a big deal. That's why when you get your commercial driver's license, you learn that as a commercial driver, you are not allowed to have any alcohol in your system whatsoever. Because the federal government may get a lot of things wrong, but one thing they've come to understand is, is that alcohol and driving an 80,000 pound vehicle is not a good mixture. And this is why scripture speaks so strongly and is crystal clear about avoiding Intoxicating substances, Proverbs 20 and verse number 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But the Holy Spirit chose this to help us understand how He is supposed to control our lives. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Don't do that, because that only leads to destruction and pain and injury. But... Be filled with the Spirit. So here's the illustration. The Holy Spirit works in our life in the exact opposite manner as alcohol does. The more alcohol you consume, the more you are under its influence. We use that expression, driving under the influence, right? Right? But in the opposite but similar way, the more the Holy Spirit fills you, the more influence He will have in your life. This is the concept known as the filling of the Spirit. When we are under His influence, we are controlled by God's desires, and the desires of our flesh are inhibited by the Holy Spirit. So like when, you, when a person gets drunk, the desires of their flesh are not inhibited. They just do whatever they feel like. They say whatever they feel like. That's why they get in fights. That's why they say and do awful things and hurt people and hurt themselves. But when we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, those desires of our flesh are suppressed. 
so that we don't do just whatever we feel like. We don't say just whatever we feel like. We say and we do what God wants us to do. The Ephesians would have, when they worshipped Bacchus, filled themselves with their God, and the, the beha- they, their behavior then would have been horrible as they were under the influence of alcohol. The believers, on the other hand, were to be filled with the Spirit and to behave according to His influence. And as Christians, that is what God commands us. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Now turn with me back to Luke chapter 4. What I want to do is take the rest of our time today and and try to get a a good firm idea of what this idea of being filled with the Spirit really means. And then Lord willing tonight we're going to look at a story from the book of Acts that I think illustrates it so wonderfully. But in Luke chapter 4, I want to begin here and talk to you. If you're keeping an outline, this would be Roman numeral 1. I've just given you a 14-minute introduction, okay? Roman numeral 1, we're going to look at the first instances of the filling of the Spirit in our New Testament. Now, uh, first of all, let me just say that the Spirit, Holy Spirit works differently in the New Testament than He did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, He came on certain people at certain times to empower them to do certain things. But in the New Testament, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is permanent. That is, once you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in your heart and He never leaves. All right? God, the third person of the Trinity, if you're a Christian, is in you right now and you'll never get more of Him than you already have. Let's be clear on that point. We're not talking about somehow getting a bigger dose of Holy Spirit. That just doesn't happen. Either you have Him or you don't. And if you're saved, you have Him. So what exactly does this filling look like? What does that mean? Well, the language you can kind of see in even the wording when you think of about this, 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 this uh, bottle here being full of water. It's kind of this, this, this idea using this illustration of, of pouring a liquid into or onto something and, and, and filling it up with it so that there's no room for anything else. And in Luke chapter 4, we find... Uh, One of the first instances um, where it's used in the life of Jesus, at least, in describing him, Luke 4 and verse number 1, it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, this was right after Jesus' baptism. And you may remember that the Holy Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and rested upon him. And it was immediately after that that he went into the wilderness. There he would be tempted of the devil. But notice the language that's used here is that he was full of the Holy Ghost. Now, what I want to point out just from this particular instance is that it doesn't say that he was full of the Holy Ghost and so he immediately began speaking in tongues. Or he was full of the Holy Ghost and so he uh, immediately began to heal people. Now Jesus would heal people. Jesus would do miracles. But there's no connection here between the filling of the Spirit, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, and any kind of miracles being performed. So understand that. There are a lot of people today that that many of them call themselves charismatic in theology that teach that the filling of the Spirit enables you to do certain miraculous things. Like if you get filled with the Spirit, one of the big ones is they say you'll be able to speak in tongues. And they define tongues as some kind of a random language that nobody's ever heard and you're going to need a supernatural interpreter because it's not a real language anyway. Well, there's so much wrong with that theology, but it boils down to this. It's not biblical. All right. The Bible never says that if you are filled with the Spirit, then you will speak in tongues and you must speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit. There's no connection in Scripture at all in that way. And so anybody that says that being filled with the Spirit means that you're going to do something, something miraculous, ah, they're missing the point. That's not what it's about. Notice another thing that is commonly misunderstood for the filling of the Spirit is emotionalism. And I've heard this so many times. Somebody will come away from a very emotional church service and they will describe it this way. They'll say, well, that was a very spirit-filled service. And my question is, well, what was spirit-filled about it? Is it because everybody got very emotional? Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with emotions per se, but that also doesn't necessarily mean that the Holy Spirit was involved with it. Listen, I can walk through my house in the dark and stub my toe and I'm going to get very emotional very fast. And I can tell you there ain't much of the Holy Spirit involved in that right there. Okay? 
But they'll describe a service that was very emotional and say, well, that was very spirit-filled. Well, it might have been, but if you're confusing emotions for the Holy Spirit, you're, you're getting off. Notice again, what emotion is equated with Jesus here in Luke 4 and verse number 1? Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost ran the aisles and hooped and hollered and shouted, glory, hallelujah? No. Now, is it wrong to shout glory, hallelujah? Not if it's appropriate. Feel free. But that's not the same thing as being filled with the Spirit. I remember when I was in Bible college, I had a professor. Uh, he's uh, no longer teaching there at the Bible college. He pastors a church in South Carolina. But he told a story about when he was a young man. He went to a church that had uh, more of a charismatic leaning in its theology when he was first saved. And, uh, and it was a type of church where every once in a while someone would just take a running spell. Be in church service and then all of a sudden, you know, sister so-and-so would get up and run the aisles. Maybe even literally go out the door and run a lap and come back in the other way. And he was up in the choir one day and before the church service he had told his wife. Now this is the story as he related it to me. He said he told his wife on his way to church that morning, you watch, I'm going to get to preach next Sunday. And she said, what do you mean? He said, you just wait, you just wait and see. And so that, that Sunday morning, uh, during the choir number, he took a shouting fit. And he ran down out of the choir, and he ran up the aisle of hoop and holler, and he came back up the other aisle of hoop and holler, and came back up and just had himself a good old-fashioned glory fit. Well, the pastor came up to him right after the service and said, Boy, the Holy Spirit's all over you. You've got to preach for us next Sunday. Now, don't misunderstand me. I... I am not advocating for boring, okay? All right, let's, let's try that again. I'm going to say, I'm going to say I'm not advocating for boring, and we're going to practice. I want to hear at least 30% of you say amen, okay? I'm not advocating for boring. Amen. Hey, you good job, wonderful. But what I am cautioning you against is confusing the legitimate filling of the Spirit, and counterfeits, all right? And emotionalism for the sake of emotionalism is a counterfeit. Let's, let's stay here in Luke, and let's go back to chapter 1. Let's go to the very first instances where this kind of language of being filled with the Spirit is used in the New Testament. We're going to see in just a moment that it was actually prophesied in the Old Testament, but Luke chapter 1, verse 41. It says, It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. From there, Elizabeth would go on to pronounce a blessing on Mary, and that would contain a little bit of prophecy. Now, some people would say, Aha, see there? Filling of the Spirit leads to miraculous gifts of prophecy. Well, hold on just a second. When you really look at what Elizabeth did, what Elizabeth did was nothing more than confirm the word of God that had already been given. That's all she did. All she did was affirm the word of God. Look over at verse 67. His father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, see that? All right? He was Filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied, saying, You say, Well, there it is again. Filled with the Holy Spirit, miraculous gift of prophecy. Hold on, wait a second. First of all, we're in a unique time period. We're not in the, in the New Testament proper yet. Jesus hasn't died, been buried, and rise again. The church hasn't begun. So we're in a, we're in a little bit of, a, of a, tr a transitional phase here. But secondly, when you look at what Zacharias says, all he's doing is confirming the word of God. If somebody claims to be filled with the Spirit, or if somebody claims to be following the Spirit, and they're contradicting the written Word of God, they're not. That is, they're not filled, and they're not following. I tell you, this, this is a frustrating thing for me as, as a pastor, is to hear people say to me, the Spirit is leading me to do A, B, and C. And A, B, and C are unscriptural. Is God contradicting himself? But people will frame their decisions like that often because it's, it's almost like the universal shield against criticism, right? 
How can you tell me I'm wrong? The Spirit is leading me to do this. I can tell you that because whatever you say is the Spirit leading you isn't because it's contradicting the Bible. The filling of the Spirit very clearly uh, is something that has to do with directing us and where we go and what we do. And there's a particular emphasis in Scripture, and I find this very interesting, that the filling of the Spirit has a lot to do with what we say, with our words. That's very important. Turn over to Acts chapter 1 now. Acts chapter 1, we find the day of Pentecost recorded for us. And this is, this is significant when it comes to understanding how the Holy Spirit works in our lives today because this is really a pivotal transitional moment. In Acts chapter 1, we're going to start with here um, because this is Jesus before the day of Pentecost, before He ascends back to heaven. It says, verse 4 of Acts 1, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the... What's the next two words there? Holy Ghost, not many days hence. So Jesus, and you can go back to John uh, 16 and read this too, where Jesus promised that when He left, the Holy Spirit would be sent in His place and He would dwell permanently with the believers. And what Jesus is saying here to these disciples, He's giving them instructions. When I leave, you go back to Jerusalem and wait. You're going to be witnesses, but wait for the power of the Holy Ghost that's going to come upon you. So they did that. They go back to Jerusalem there in the upper room. They had a 10-day uh, prayer meeting. In verse 4 of Acts chapter 2, we find that the, that the Holy Spirit came down and there was on them, as it were, uh, cloven tongues of fire. In verse number 4 of Acts 2, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we do see here that in this first instance of the Holy Spirit filling the believers and coming to indwell them and to fill them, that there was a miraculous ability associated with that. But the problem is if you try to link the two inseparably, you're misunderstanding what the Lord's saying here. These are two different things. They were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The, the emphasis here is that the ability to speak in other languages, human languages that already existed, was not from themselves, but from the Holy Spirit. Now, I find it fascinating that in this particular instance, there's also a connection, if I could say it that way, made between the filling of the Spirit and drunkenness. Look at verse 13. So the, the, the disciples have been speaking in tongues, sharing the gospel. And others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. People heard them speaking in other tongues, in tongues they didn't understand, and they assumed they were just babbling. And if you've ever been about a person who's drunk, one of the things that's, that's very distinguishable about them is their speech will usually be slurred. It's just very hard to understand what they're saying oftentimes. And so people looked at these believers that were now filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues and said, well, they're drunk. So Peter stands up in verse 14. He says, um, <clears throat> ye men of Jude." Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So Peter stands up and says, no, 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 no. They're not drunk with wine. You got it all wrong, but they are filled with something. And it's what Joel prophesied. And he goes back to the Old Testament now to show that the filling of the Spirit was a ministry that God had predicted, prophesied many, many years before. And he quotes Joel as saying that God would pour out. There's that language again, that liquid language, if you want to say it that way, of God pouring out His Spirit so that we would be filled with the Spirit and then we could be what God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do. They literally thought they were drunk because of the, uh, the obvious effect that this filling of the Spirit had on them. Now, sometimes it was accompanied by miracles in the, Old in the New Testament. 
but not all the time. You can look at many instances. I'm, I don't have time. Let me just give you some to look at. You can look at Peter in Acts 4 and verse number 8. All of the believers in Acts 4 and verse 31. The deacons in Acts 6 and verse 3. Uh, Stephen in Acts 7 and verse 55. Saul in Acts 9 verse 17 and Acts 13 and verse number 9. Barnabas in Acts eleven twenty four. 24. Disciples in Acts 13, 52. You look at all of those instances and what you find is that the filling of the Spirit really did not have a lot to do with the direct ability to perform miracles. Sometimes it did, but a lot of times it did not. So being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that you're going to be miraculously be able to heal people, that you'll be able to predict the future or speak in a language that you've never learned. But what the filling of the Spirit, Spirit does obviously mean is this. It means that His control in your life will be noticeable to others. Let me say that again. It means that his control in your life will be noticeable to others. That is the consistent thread throughout Scripture that if someone was full of the Holy Spirit, then there were direct effects of that that were noticeable to those around them. Now, with this understanding then of what it means to be filled in the Spirit, it means to be under His influence so that it is noticeable to others that He's in control of our life. Let me touch on two more very important things about the filling of the Spirit. First of all, if you want to turn back to Ephesians chapter 5, I want to answer the question about the frequency of the filling of the Spirit. And if you're particularly nerdy, you might be thinking I'm of like gigahertz and megahertz frequency. No, I mean, I mean, how often? How often do you have to be filled with the Spirit? This is very important because, again, there are a lot of people who teach that, that you need to be filled over and over and over and over and over and over again. And, and what they mean by that is, uh, um, is that you need these, these dramatic crisis events in which you get this you know, supernatural booster shot, I guess it was, of the Holy Spirit. How many times do you need to be filled with the Spirit? Well, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, that's kind of like asking how many times do you need to eat? I mean, if I were to ask you that question, how many times do you need to eat? Could you give me a number? Well, you might be able to break it down. Well, yes, I need to eat five to seven times a day, you know, something like that. No, 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 give me, give me a number from, for the rest of your life. How many times are you going to need to eat? You can't do that. As long as you live, you're going to need to eat. You're going to need to be filled with some kind of food. Why? Because that's what you need to exist. If you stop eating, you're not going to exist for very long, right? So how many times do we need to be filled with the Spirit? The question itself is based on a wrong assumption. We need to be always being filled with the Spirit. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The word be there is in the present tense, and it's an ongoing action. So we could literally say it this way, be being filled with the Spirit. It's constant. It's, it's just like this bottle of water right here. Now, I've taken a sip out of it, so there's about that much gone. What happens if I take another sip? There's more gone. Now, eventually, this is going to be empty, and it's going to look like, it's going to look like this one right here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to throw it right down there. All right? So if I want to keep this full, I can do one of two things. I can never drink out of it, which would not benefit me at all, or I could just make sure I continually replenish it. All right, in a similar way, being filled with the Spirit is not one crisis event. It's not some kind of a second blessing that you get as a result of a certain, you know, going through a certain religious ritual or something like that. Being filled with the Spirit is an ongoing way of living for the Christian. It's not something that should come and go. It's something that should be ever growing in your life. Now, there are some important connections that we find in Scripture between these things and the filling of the Spirit. Let me give you just two. First of all, there's an important connection between prayer and the filling of the Spirit. 
If the Holy Spirit's going to have total control and influence in your life, you must be praying. If you're not praying, then you're not being led of the Holy Spirit. And I don't have time to really develop that out this morning. So let me just give you one verse of Scripture. Acts 4 and verse 31. It says, When they had prayed, the place was shaken together where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Connection between prayer and the obvious filling and obvious control of the Holy Spirit that led to them speaking the word of God with boldness. Look, if you're not a praying Christian, you are not living a spirit-filled life because you're not allowing him to influence and control you like you should. Second important thing you need, and that is the Word of God, the Bible. And by that I mean you need to be reading it, you need to be studying it, you need to be sitting under the preaching of the, of the Word of God, you need to be reading good books that teach you about the Bible, you need to be listening to good podcasts and listening to good sermons. You need to get as much of the Bible as you can. Why? Because the word of God is the sword's spirit. This is the spirit, the spirit's sword right here. And how can you say you are full of the spirit, yet empty of the scripture? It's a contradiction. You need the Bible. You need the private and the public ministries of the word. That is, reading it and studying it for yourself, but also putting yourself under the sound biblical preaching and teaching of God's word. If you're not doing those things at least, you're not being led and controlled by the Spirit. Let me give you a third thing. To be filled with the Spirit, you need the fellowship of the believers. You say, wait a second. I thought we believed in the individual priesthood of the believers. I thought I didn't need nobody. Well, let's, let's make a very important distinction here. You are dependent on no other human being than the Lord Jesus Christ for your standing before God. You don't need me. You don't need your spouse. You don't need your parents. You can be right with God with just you. Okay? Because Jesus has done that for you. He is your great high priest so that you can bone boldly into the throne of grace. See, for many years, the uh, Catholic Church and other churches taught that, no, 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 no. You can't come to God for yourself. You can't do that. All right? Uh, you need to go through the priest. You need to go through, you know, Father Scratch and Sniff over here if you're going to come to come to God. All right. But all along, there were believers who said, uh, "No, we don't." There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, not Father Scratch and Sniff. Okay. And so this distinction, this Baptist distinction of the individual priesthood, meaning that we don't need a father, we don't need a pope, we don't need a cardinal or whatever other bird to get to God, is an important doctrine. But that does not mean that you get to be the Lone Ranger. Doesn't mean that you can just run off and go wherever and do whatever. You still need the fellowship of the believers. In the New Testament, there are over 30 different one another commands given, most of them in the context of a local assembly. When the Apostle Paul or other writers of Scripture said, love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, don't grudge one another, use hospitality one to another, don't envy one another, bear one another's burdens, so on and so forth. What is that all about? It's about the fellowship of believers that God has given us, Ephesians chapter 4, to help us grow up into Him, into Christ. You cannot separate yourself from the fellowship of the believers and be filled with the Spirit like you should be. You just can't. You're not being led of the Spirit if you are being led away from the church. You need prayer. You need the Word of God. You need the fellowship of the believers. And I want to I close with one, one final truth about the filling. And that is the fruit of the filling. And I'm just going to touch on this as we close. I don't know if you know this about me, but I like to eat. I like to eat food. I like to eat lots of different kinds of food. And I like pie. How many of you like pie? I like pie, all right? I like cake, too, chocolate cake especially. But I'm more of an icing kind of a guy, you know? The world's broken into two classes of people. The people who, who think cake is an excuse to eat icing and then all the weird people, Okay. But I'm not talking about cake. I'm talking about pie, all right? And I like, I like apple pie. Ooh, my wife makes a killer apple pie. But I really like blueberry pie, too. To me, that's, ooh, that's good stuff right there. 
Now, if you took a nice homemade pie crust and you rolled it out and you put it in the pan and then took the top layer, layer and just put it on there without anything in between it and just stuck it in the oven, what would you get? Crust. It may be some really, really nice, crispy, flaky, sweet, perfectly done crust, but it's still just crust. Is it pie? It's air pie? No. It's just, it's just crust, okay? If the Holy Spirit is filling your life, it's going to make a difference in your behavior. And there are a lot of, a lot of Christians who they can check all the boxes... And in their head, they know all the theological facts, but they're just an empty crust. Can I say it this way? They're just crusty Christians. And I know that's a funny way to say it, but that's actually what's going on. I made a comment to my wife some weeks ago. We were uh, um, at a, um, a, a music event, and there was this one particular person that we had interacted with uh, uh, throughout the course of a couple days. I don't think she was a believer. I've, I, I just based on things that were said and, and everything, uh, I don't think she was a believer. But she was such a kind and gracious lady. And I made a comment to my wife. I'm like, why can't all Christians behave like that? She's not even a believer, and she just makes you want to be around her, you know? She's just nice, gracious, kind. Look, that's how Christians ought to be. But somewhere along the line, we've lost the filling, and we've ended up crusty. What is the filling? Genesis, or Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You know what? If you're filled with the Spirit, that is going to be the filling that's in your life. That's the kind of person that is a blessing to others around them. I mentioned earlier, and we'll get into this more tonight, Lord willing, about how there's a correlation between filling of the Spirit and our speech. If you think about those fruits of the Spirit, how much of those are demonstrated in the things that we say? All right, fruit of the Spirit is love. Of course, love is an action word. But we ought to say loving things. Love, joy, all right? We ought to rejoice, that is express our joy. Peace. How do we maintain peace? How do we, how do we be peacemakers? Primarily with our words. And you know, you go down this list and it's, there's such a strong connection between the things we say and the Holy Spirit's control in our life. And if the Holy Spirit is indeed filling you, then these are nine of the obvious evidences that will be filling your life. We got, John 15 and verse number 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. God wants us to be filled with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now this morning, you may be wondering, what do I, what do? I, do? I, I understand what you're saying about the filling of the Spirit, being His control in our lives, and um, you know, being under His influence as it were, and not necessarily emotional, not necessarily miraculous, it's just letting Him control me. Well, what do I do with it? Well... Let me try to put it simply. You need to understand today that being filled with the Spirit is just supposed to be a normal way of living. Not a second blessing received by some super saints after, you know, ingesting some mystic theological potion, as it were. But it should be said of every one of us there goes a person who's filled with the Spirit. How do I know? Because they're loving. Because they're peacemakers. Because they're long-suffering. Because they're joyful. I, how do you know they're filled with the Spirit? Well, I can tell by the way they're acting. If a police officer suspects that a person is driving under the influence of alcohol, they're going to pull them over and they're going to administer a certain series of tests. Now, back in the day, they may still do this, they would do a simple test where they would have them walk a line. Police officer might take a piece of chalk, 
or might use one of the lines on the road and just say, all right, I want you to put your feet one in front of the other and put your hands out and I want you to walk the line. And some of you are thinking, I can't do that sober. What do you mean, dude? But you're supposed to walk the line like this. And if you can walk the line like that, well, it's a pretty good indication that you're sober. Not definite, but pretty good. So let me just boil it down like this. How are you walking today? Are you walking straight and narrow? Or are you walking crooked? See, the goal of being filled with the Spirit is not to brag about it or not to have an emotional high. The goal of being filled with the Spirit is to walk the straight and narrow way so that God gets the glory that He deserves. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't think we as Baptists maybe think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit as often as we should. Maybe we overreact against some of the false teachings out there and we just avoid teaching on the Holy Spirit out of a wrong sense of caution. But can I say to you this morning, it's okay to think about and be thankful for the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life. And it's not, you know, crazy, mystical weirdness. It's simply He's there living in you, guiding you and directing you, prompting you through His Word to say this, to do that, not say this, don't do that. And as you allow Him to control you, you are being filled with the Spirit. And what that looks like is walking the way that God wants you to walk in love, joy, peace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a simple question this morning as we close. Are you being filled with the Spirit? The only other option is walking according to your flesh. Either you're walking according to the Spirit or you're walking according to the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. Which is it? This morning you have an opportunity to correct course. If you have not been following the Holy Spirit's leading in your life, you need to confess it. Get it right with God and walk out of these doors today enjoying the filling of the Spirit.